So the definition and introduction. So by basic definition, digital forensics is a branch of computer science and a set of methodologies as well as procedures and techniques that helps us identify, gather, preserve, extract, as well as interpret, and finally, documenting and presenting all the evidence from computing equipments, such as any discoverable evidence that is adaptable during the legal and, administra and administrative proceeding. So basically, digital forensics involves you using methodologies that can aid you to identify, for starters, after identify preserving that digital evidence, after preserving the digital evidence, it involves methodologies of extracting that digital evidence. Upon extraction of that digital evidence, it also involves methodologies of you analyzing, documenting that digital evidence, following what is known as the chain of custody. So the main goal of digital forensics is basically to, like I earlier alluded, to identify, collect, preserve, analyze the data in a way that preserves its, its integrity. So by preserving its integrity, that way you're ensuring that this digital evidence is admissible in a court of law, because if you do not preserve your digital evidence or do not follow the chain of custody or the legal standards as well as the regulatory bodies, that the legal standards that the regulatory bodies have put in place, that digital evidence may not be admissible in a court of law. So following the main aim of digital forensics, you have to, you have to conduct your analysis, your extraction, um, your preservation, as well as your documenting and presenting in a way that follows the chain of custody and you have to ensure that the, the digital the digital evidence is unaltered that way it will be admissible in a legal case or a court of law so that is digital forensics and its main goal in a nutshell so well, we're going to go on and define what known as cyber investigation so cyber investigation is the process of gathering documenting the evidence from a computer to a computing device in a court in a court admissible way using investigation and analysis techniques following the chain of custody take note chain of custody this is a very important this is a very important uh, this is a very important a very important thing that you have to follow during uh, your your forensic process so this add uh, to, to to break it down at defining that uh, this is um, this is a way. I want to define it in three phases. I want to define it as people, processes, as well as procedure. So this 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 is defined as people that are involved in this case, the processes that are involved in this case, as well as the procedures. They have to ensure that the evidence hasn't been tempered or mishandled or contaminated during the handling process throughout the process from from the extraction process identification preservation as well as the presentation process so the chain of custody is the procedure and people and processes that ensure that digital evidence isn't tempered with throughout the stages of digital of cyber investigations all the way to presentation so that is the chain of custody in simpler terms so we're going to go ahead and um look at the types of digital evidence so um, we have logs video footage images archives we've got active data metadata residue data we also have volatile data in volatile data we as a sub of volatile data we also have what is known as um, um non-volatile data so I'll, I'll speak into that later on then we also have uh, what is known as replicant data. So logs, so basically these are records of events, happenings on any any system. A computer system could be a mobile phone, could be a, could be a laptop, could be a server, could be a network, or could be an application. So any happenings, any executions, deletions, 
moving, coping, all sorts of happenings that happen on a computer device, on a network, or on applications. All those happenings are what is known as logs. We're going to go in details and look into look into logs, where they're stored and how they can be used and how they can. Um, then I, I think later on in the in the demo, I'm going to I'm going to show you how helpful logs can be in a digital digital uh, in a cyber investigation realm. Then also what we also have another type of digital evidence that is known as video footage as well as image. So this is basically visual representation scenes or objects that can be captured by a camera, webcam, smartphone, etc. Then we also have what, what is known as archive. This is collecting of files or data that can be compressed or encrypted for storage or transmission purposes. So then we also have what is known as active data files or data that are readily accessible or visible to users or rather an operating system. Then we also, we're also going to, um, the other type of digital evidence is metadata. So metadata is a key, 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 very key aspect of digital forensics, cyber investigations. So I'm going to show you how that is important in the demo as well. Yeah, because uh, metadata, these are maybe, these describe other data or applications they provide perhaps information about data you know I, i'm going to give an example of information and data so how data is is that it's just raw it's undefined and it's unprocessed but then when you add elements to read elements of when it was created uh when it was moved when it was renamed its extensions yeah that those things those aspects are what you would refer to as metadata the descriptions of that particular information yeah that's what you should think of when you hear the term metadata so i'll show you how such things are important uh, in digital forensic digital forensics investigation so yeah so in, even even like information such as author titles, keywords, locations, settings. Yeah, when you take a picture, it's going to show you this picture was taken at such a location, was taken by such a phone at such and such a time. That is what is referred to as metadata. So I'm going to show you as we as we proceed why that's very important in the demo as well. So then you also know of what is known as residue data. So files or data that are deleted or overwritten by or overwritten by but remain in some form of storage device so um i'm i'm also going to give an example of residue data so before i do that it's important to note that these can provide information such as previous content deletion dates uh the recovery status so Examples of where residue data might reside would be on your Windows recycle bin, files that are temporary, then also Slack spaces, yes, such. Then we're also going to go to the next one, which is known as volatile data. So these are files of data that are stored in the memory of a device, and these disappear when the device is turned off or the spark loss. So I'll give an example of RAM, RAM data. That data is, is volatile by the name, literally. So volatile data, this is a type of data that is stored in the RAM and expires when the device is, when the device is turned off. So, yeah. And we are going to go into the next one, which is called replicant data. So, these are copies of backups of files or data that are created for security or recovery purposes. So these are data, these are, this is type of information that you would go back to if you, if, if you want to recover a backup. So by definition, they're created for backup purposes or recovery should you lose your information. So that's that about the types of digital evidence. There are other sub, sub, sub 
some types of digital evidence, but the main types of digital evidence, these are the main types of digital evidence, logs, footage, archives, active data, metadata, residue data, volatile data, as well as replicant data. So I, I did mention that uh, there is, there is I'm, I'm going to add on to volatile data, there is what is called um, non-volatile data. So this is the data that is basically the opposite of volatile data. It, well, as volatile data disappears when you turn off uh, a system, computer system, when you shut it down or restart it, it's going to disappear. But on the on the other hand, non-volatile data doesn't disappear. When you boot up a computer system, you'll still find such information. It doesn't depend on power. It does not disappear when you turn off a computer system. So these are the main types of digital evidence. So moving on to our next segment, which is called cyber investigation process. So under this, we're going to define it as well as speak into the steps that lead into cyber investigation or the steps that fully make up or encompass cyber investigations. So the process, the process of digital forensics and cyber investigation consists of four main phases. Namely, we have identification. Then we have preservation. We also have what is known as extraction. And we also have what is known as um, analysis. And lastly, we have what is known as presentation. So I'm going to speak into these in, in details so that we can have an understanding of these particular four steps of cyber investigations. So keep in mind that I did mention that these follow what is known as the chain of custody. As long as they do not follow the chain of custody, these, these cyber investigations that you carry out as a forensic investigator are void and inadmissible in a court of law. So these steps put together, married with the foundation of chain of custody, is what gives you as a forensic investigator evidence that is admissible in a court of law. So we're going to start with um, the first one being identification. So by definition, this is you as a forensic investigator locating where the, de where the evidence is, relevant devices, relevant data sources that may contain potential evidence to the particular case you're trying to make. This may require physical access to the device or remote access or rather network access or even cloud access. So this is basically you noting that, okay, this is, this is, this is my scope. This is where I'm going to look for evidence. These are the affected computer systems or these are the suspected computer systems that have been compromised, may have been compromised or are actually compromised, you locating and defining your, 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 your crime scene. That is what is involved in identification. So it, it, by definition, it involves, this is a phrase that involves uh, finding, locating the relevant devices or data sources that may contain potential evidence for the case. So like I mentioned, it may either require you as an investigator to, to be physically uh, on the crime scene or remote access to the devices that contain the evidence or rather cloud access to the to the to the devices to the services devices that contain the, the digital evidence so you mapping up your area knowing your crime scene knowing the devices that are involved services that are involved this is what is known as the process of identification in cyber investigation so the next step in cyber investigation is what is known as the preservation phase. So this is you as a forensic investigator basically preserving your crime scene. Remember, I'm, I'm going to keep referring to our, our parent term, which is chain of custody. Chain of custody is, is pretty cardinal in this step of preservation because this is where it fully lies, the chain of custody. You, you identify your crime scene, but then you have to follow procedures that ensure that you do not alter the digital evidence you've identified. 
you ensure that the infected computer computer systems or suspected computer systems that have been hacked nothing is changed and you ensure that your digital evidence is not tampered with so this is you preserving your crime scene preserving the digital evidence that you've identified in your previous steps so by definition i'm going to run through it this is a phase that involves securing and protecting the digital devices and data from alteration damage or loss so this may require creating copies or images of data using write blockers encryption tools isolating the devices or devices or network from external access so like i said you're doing this so that your digital evidence is not tempered with and it is quite cardinal to to note that this kind of evidence that we deal with as forensic investigators is very very sensitive data imagine think of you typing a word document i, I should think I, I i would like to think i have grammars on this particular call i've got developers on this call think of you typing a word document or writing code the moment you remove a comma the moment you remove a full stop that entirely means something different that entirely changes the the entire code it changes the entire program it might not run it might run very buggy so that brought to digital evidence this is uh, that's the importance of preservation of digital evidence so anything to do with computers anything to do with software anything to do that is digital is pretty pretty i'd like to think use the term fragile it's very fragile data so preservation is a very very cardinal step in the cyber investigation step so i'll go on to the next step which is uh, extraction so extraction this involves uh this involves cyber investigators collecting electronic um electronic evidence from virus sources including computers servers mobile devices network logs cloud storage this evidence may be, may include system logs files emails database records or more the data data collecting is using forensically sound methods to ensure that it remains admissible in a court of law again still pondering on it being admissible because it's pointless you understand you, you understand the type of attack you understand that this organization was hacked you as a forensic investigator you understand all that but then you can't take this information to the courts of law because you didn't follow the chain of custody you didn't you didn't use forensically sound methods to ensure that your 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 evidence remains admissible in a court of law so it's quite cardinal to 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 ensure that you you, you, you still maintain the chain of custody so during extraction you've found you've identified your evidence after identifying your evidence you've preserved your evidence and now you have to extract your evidence so you have to you have to you have to collect the evidence is it from a mobile phone is it from a computer is it from a network are these logs is it a sample malicious file are these viruses is it a ransomware now you have to get it and analyze it you have to get the logs and read the logs the network logs and you have to reverse engineer the malware and fully understand so extraction this is just basically you ripping off your, the evidence you've identified and preserved you get it and later on we'll speak about what you do with that extracted evidence in the next slide so the next slide being analysis so these things are in cohesion they're quite they quite follow a systematic and a systematic order so it's as you can see as you've noted we started with you identifying it identifying it you preserve it so it's unchanged after preserving it then you can extract it after you extract it then as an investigator you go on and analyze the the evidence so this phase by definition involves examining and extracting to borrow from the previous slide extracting the digital evidence 
from the devices, data sources using virus tools and techniques. So these virus tools and techniques are going to take us back to what Elias spoke into chain of custody. So chain of custody to you as a forensic investigator should be like a Bible. It, it should be at heart. As I do these things, I must follow this certain approach because I might sweat and know the bad guys, but I'm not going to go anywhere if I didn't follow this. So I'm in a very forensic acceptable manner. This may involve you recovering deleted files, hidden files, decrypting encrypted data, yeah, reconstructing fragmented data, identifying malicious software, not only identifying it, by, but going on to understand the malicious software, what it was trying to do on the network, what it was trying to do on a computer system, what it would have potentially done, understand the damage. So, as well as the activities on the, either the computer system, the network, or anywhere where the, the incident happened. So, we'll go on to the next slide. So, we have what is known as presentation. So, presentation involves um, preparing and presenting the digital evidence in a clear, in a clear manner that can be understood in the court of law. Because, for, take for example, this, this is an incident of a hacking attack. So you, you cannot go with uh, cyber security or forensics jargon in a court of law. So you must interpret your digital evidence and your findings and put them in a manner that people in the courts of law are, are going to understand. So this might involve, this, this involves creating a very, very detailed report as well as um, charts, graphs, timelines that summarize your findings. So, what you found during your analysis process? Okay, I found that this IP address. Uh, I think these guys are the perpetrators. They might have hacked this organization because their IP address is matching the the malicious IP the the, the malicious IP address that I found with this virus that I extracted from computers A, B, C, D. So you basically reporting down everything you did in your analysis, everything you did in, in your memory analysis, everything you did in your malware analysis, everything you did in your disk analysis. sums up presentation during this phase. So we're now going to talk, we're now going to speak into the, we're going to speak into the, the methods as well as the tools that you use. The tools that you use to identify, preserve, extract, analyze, and present your digital evidence. So, we're going to start with um, log analysis. I did I did mention as we started this class that I'm going to speak in a bit into details about what logs are. So, I I think I did even mention, but not at length, what precisely a log is. So, by definition, this is a process. Uh, this is a process of collecting, parsing analyzing log data from various sources such as a server network devices applications to monitor and improve system performance security as well as compliance so the first reason the the, the the first and main reason why you are, you are monitoring these activities i did mention that this is why a log think of a log as um you creating a web document once that web document is created you move it from this folder to the next folder. You then rename it. You then delete it. After deleting it, you then recover it. And then you then send it to the next computer. So that entire cycle, 
all that information is done the steps you're creating renaming deleting recovering and sending it all that's stored somewhere in what you would call the the windows event manager or rather the windows event viewer all that's stored there so and the main reason why that information is stored is to analyze the performance how fast does it take to delete the word document how fast does it take to rename it how fast does it take to to recover it or send it that's one for security reasons you're a forensic investigator you're trying to find out when the word document was deleted when it was sent you you want to get that metadata the timestamps so that's why logs are important and for compliance sake that's why logs are there but us as forensic investigators we're going to we're going to borrow the security element and the security aspect of computer logs so which is us trying to to get the metadata of of a certain uh, a certain application i'm using word document in this case we're trying to find out okay it was created on this date it was actually modified so there's somebody else that came to change this word document when they modified they even shared it with this person so all that you're collecting as your digital evidence so that's how we would use logs as a forensic investigator so the main source of sources of log the world as well as we have solutions security solutions that are called the security but its day-to-day -day life is just monitoring the applications systems networks storing all those activities so that's that about log analysis i'm going to go to the next slide okay then our next slide is what is known as disk analysis so disk analysis by definition uh, so I'll start over with malware analysis. I I was mentioning that as a forensic investigator, it is quite essential that you understand malware analysis because it's a very it's 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 a it's it's quite a fundamental concept when you're dealing with uh, cyber investigations because most of the cyber attacks that happen, most of the cyber breaches that happen, these ride on malware 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 attacks such as ransomware um payloads viruses trojans so most of these most of these cyber attacks ride on malware so it's quite essential as a forensic investigator to understand what malware analysis is and to know how to analyze malware in a forensic um, in a forensic manner because most of the most of the incidents that you find out there as a forensic cyber forensic investigator are uh, incidents to do with uh, malware. So by definition, malware is malware analysis is a systematic and detailed examine way of uh, examining uh, apologies, we have a technical to understand situation now, but I'm sure I might be able to its join functionality um, to yes. its behavior. Yes, yes, he just had an issue with his uh, connection. Network. So it's quite essential that you understand malware analysis because of these factors that, I've, that I have just highlighted. So you need to understand the threats that the malicious software has on the, on the environment, the computer system or a network. You need to, you need to understand its impact the kind of information it's stolen, the kind of information it's encrypted, what it could potentially do should it succeed in that environment or a computer network, the kind of um, its behavior in general, the things it could do, the harm it could cause to the, to the environment or the harm it caused, could cause or caused. Because in this case, we're talking about either the cyber attack has already happened or this is before the cyber attack actually happens so the types of malware analysis that uh, the general type of malware analysis types of malware analysis are static analysis dynamic analysis as well as reverse engineering so static analysis just involves you examining um you examining the the malware code without 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 running the malware 
So this may involve either deleting the binary code, extracting the string, identifying the file, the, the modifications it's made by the registry, and undercovering its potential uh, its potential indicators of compromise. It is this is the type of analysis where you don't actually run the, the malware. You want to, to see, okay, what has it done? Has it made modifications in the registry? Did it move from here to here? And what IOCs is it having? Is it having any malicious IP addresses attached to it? So this is what you would think of as static analysis. Then dynamic analysis, this, um, think of dynamic, dynamic analysis as you actually executing the malware in a but not not on a live on a live environment or clean environment maybe executing in a sandbox a controlled environment an isolated environment from the entire network you run the malware and observe its behavior including you monitoring uh, its system calls network communication the, the the kind of modifications it's going to make to the file system the instructions it's going to do to the memory and basically just understand everything about that malicious file. You running it and observing it and analyzing what is currently doing it after running. That's what is what you would think of as dynamic analysis. Then there is what is known as uh, reverse engineering. Okay, so reverse engineering involves uh, maybe you decompiling the malware, disassembling the malware to review the underlying logic or algorithms that are within the malware. So this can help you just understand how the malware functions and identify how it functions, how it uh, defines the vulnerabilities and how it exploits. So basically you decompiling the code of the malicious file is that dismantling it, basically operating it. Think of a doctor splitting a human being open. Yeah, just trying to see how things are working inside. Yeah. So, yeah, these are the major, major types of malware analysis. These are the core types of malware analysis, but the, we have a sub of these, which is behavior analysis I've spoken into, but uh, what is also known as um, code analysis, yeah, I, it's pretty much reverse engineering. Uh, we've got payload analysis, which is pretty much dynamic analysis, communication analysis, which is also embedded in dynamic analysis because you want to know who the ma uh, who where the malware is communicating. So then we have what is known as pickup analysis um, as our next type of analysis. So pickup analysis, this is a uh, a process of um, a process of obtaining, analyzing individual data packets that travel through your network. So, all the network traffic, traffic in and out of your network, traffic within your network, collecting those single single packets and analyzing them. That is what is known as uh, pickup analysis. I think I should go back. I haven't spoken into something. Um, I haven't spoken into the tools that you could use for malware analysis. I, I just figured this is quite essential that you understand. You have what is known as malware bytes and virus total. This is open source. You can find it on internet. You can just go www.virustoto.com and put in your malicious IP address, put in your malicious malware, and you have what is known as Coco Sandbox. You can run your malware there and understand it dynamically what it so then the, the tools you could use for pickup analysis which is analyzing your network traffic or the network packets in your environment you can use wireshark or wincup so that's pretty much about pickup analysis and the types of analysis that we have. So, to head back, we've spoken, um, okay, so it's time for our demo, I'm guessing, but before we get into our demo, just a recap, we've spoken into what digital forensics is, what cyber investigation is, 
we've also understood the processes the procedures that you have to follow for cyber investigations to be achieved and in a way that you should follow these steps these procedures we've spoken into all that we've spoken into you identifying it preserving the evidence after preserving the evidence how you extract the evidence the manner in which you extract the evidence what you use to extract the evidence after extracting the evidence analyzing the evidence and after in analyzing the evidence we've spoken into the types of analysis we've spoken into log analysis packet analysis we've spoken into malware analysis disk um, we've spoken into types of data we've spoken into disk analysis so we've pretty much touched everything around digital forensics cyber investigation and the entire process so now we're going to have a demo Yes. So if you can hear me right, in this particular demo, uh, in this particular demo, we have an incident of um, Bank of the People. This is a um, this is a bank that has been hacked, and you, as a forensic investigator, has been called upon to to do an investigation to investigate a hacking in a bank. Yeah. Um, you you have been called as a forensic investigator to carry out an investigation there's a hack there's a cyber attack the bank has been hacked so you as a forensic investigator has been called upon to now um find out what exactly is happening what are they talking about what is this have they really been hacked so this is our incident for the day and uh, we're going to look into that shortly allow me to stop sharing my screen and then we're sharing it after one moment. Okay. Okay, I think you can all see my screen. So I'm going to open my virtual machine. Nah, I'll run OS forensics first. And I'll run my virtual machine. What's happening, guys? Okay. Um, close this. Close this. Malicious. Okay, so guys, if you can all see my screen, we're starting our demo. You as a forensic investigator, you picked up a phone call that uh, Bank of the People has been hacked. There's a cyber attack. And you gather your forensic, your, for, uh, your forensics team. And this is you making your way to Bank of the People. And when you walk into Bank of the People, this is what you find. Let me just start my virtual machine. So it's starting. So Bank of the People uses, uh, at Bank of the People, they use, um, they use Windows, they use Windows systems and uh, they use Windows servers for almost everything. So now, what's going on here? Just give me a moment. Restart this guy. Okay, great. Yeah, I trust everybody can see my screen. This is what I would like to believe. Admin. So you, you walk into Bank of the People, the administrator comes in and puts their password on one of the critical 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 servers that stores the credit card information the loan information and this is all on windows <coughs> server and once the admin puts the password this is what you find you find saving account details state house accounts credit card details debit card details government ministry accounts international card details loan recovery accounts and you also find 
um, other other fouls, and this is what you found. This is what you find. You walk up to this. You try to open the. You try to open any folder. You find information is all encrypted. You open your readme. This is the only thing that is opening in the computer system. Everything else is encrypted. This is. It's all encrypted. You establish. Okay, let me try to read this. Oops, important files are being encrypted. This means that you are unable to access them. Follow the instruction. We guarantee you, you can decrypt all your files. And now look at the files that have been encrypted. State house information, saving account, credit card details, debit card, government ministry, all the information on this critical, critical server, it's all encrypted. It's been hit by a ransomware. And this is all that you can open the readme file. And you cannot open anything else. You can open this, it's refusing. You can open this, it's all refusing. You go to the uh, downloads, you find everything else, it's all refusing. You go to your documents, everything else is encrypted. You go to pictures, videos, it's all encrypted. You go to, yes, you go to downloads, you find this guy, this system admin was even watching a series called You. <laughs> they downloaded this series called You. Yeah, they were, uh, they were watching this on the server, and the Siri as well is also encrypted. So, you note this, right? You notice this, and here is how we're going to analyze this and investigate. Time is not our best ally, but I'm aware we did start a bit late. So, yeah. So, I'm going to shut down this virtual machine. We've seen how encrypted it is, and you're the forensic investigator, you walk in such an environment. So this is case one. Then I'm going to now close this virtual machine. Just going to power it off. Mm. Going to power it off. Then after that, we we as forensic investigators are now going to we've identified all that. This is the infected server. It's a critical server and everything is encrypted and it's a ransomware attack you've identified all that and now you preserve your digital evidence and say okay i have marked my crime scene this is the crime scene and i'm going to operate in this environment and you make copies so that you don't act on the original evidence so now think of it as we've made copies and we're not going to act on the original evidence so for this particular demo i'm going to be using a tool called os forensics so OS Forensics, we're going to start off by creating a case, case name, Bank of the People, Bank of the People, 101. Then the investigator, Engineer Nandu, then the organization, Digital Safe. Digital, digital safe. Contact details, blah, blah, blah. It's quite important that you fill in this information. Remember, we're following what is known as the chain of custody. Yes. Then you now select the type of acquisition. Is it a live acquisition on the current machine? Are we trying to investigate a disk from another machine? I just mentioned that there's that computer that is infected, infected and we've made a copy of that particular disk. I showed you tools in the presentation, certain tools that you can use to make copies of the disk. So we're going to choose where we're going to save this particular case. Okay. Um, while we save this case, that is where we're saving the case and you want to put your time zone accurate so that timestamps we talked of uh, timestamps so you want to use the correct time zone so we we have our case created there it's created all the necessary details are filled in so now the next thing we want to do is attach the digital evidence i've got a column that says add to case can add a device an attachment photos of the evidence external report notes clipboard data so in this particular case we want to add a device we've made a copy of the infected the infected system 
So we go to add image, add image, and locate locate the particular where you where the, the, the particular directory where you've stored that particular image or rather copy of the, the computer system. So this is where my copy in this current in this current case is stored. It's stored in in my drive C VMware. Yeah, so I'm just gonna go go ahead and open it. I'm trying to manage time because I'm aware we're behind time. So you select the partition or the directory that you want to analyze. Or in this case, it's a C drive that is in NTS. So you open it. Opening it, you go ahead and load it. So device is this one. Then we're going to go ahead and open it. So it opens now. So just give me a moment. No, 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 no. What am I doing? So after opening it, we have this side. This side of OS Forensics, you can auto trigger, you can manage your cases, create a case which you've already done, and you can boot a virtual machine. You can browse through your system files of the particular image or the computer, the copy of the computer you, you've made. Because we've made a comp copy of the computer. Remember, we do not want to deal directly on the on the on the affected machine. Because according to the uh, the chain of custody we're following, we can act on the live machine that has been infected in this particular case. So we've made a copy, a separate copy, so that this evidence can be uh, admissible and we can't mess up the the actual evidence yeah so there's all this so right away first off we without wasting time and in the interest of time in this case yeah we're going to go to the user activities of the particular so we're going to scan for all the user activities in this particular windows system this copy of windows system we've made so we're going to create a timestamp i'm going to go where it says full timestamp you know, we're running behind time, but it, I think the full timestamp is what's going to help us best. So it's analyzing that disk, the copy of the disk we made, and we're trying to see the activities of the particular user. What happened? You just walked into the bank when the system admin opened. The only thing you did was read the ransomware note, and all the applications are encrypted you couldn't do anything so the only thing you did as a forensic investigator following following the procedure is make an image of it you've identified it you've extracted the image and now you're analyzing the image so the first step of you analyzing the image is you want to find out what's happening on that disk so i did mention the importance of metadata its essence why metadata is very important here is what we're now going to see how metadata comes in handy so we've identified it extracted and now we're analyzing so these are the activities of, of that particular user the admin of that particular server so and uh, we have columns showing the timestamps with columns showing the item and the particular activity remember i stress the importance of understanding operating systems so that when you understand the windows operating system to its core you understand what prefetch means what pre what pre the type of activity prefetch is bam and down you understand shell bags you understand usb you understand jump list we're going to go over all that so for now what we're following the timestamps so you asked the system admin when did they notice that encryption when did they find out that that happened so we we want to scroll down and just go to where they said no i noticed this at this particular time this happened at this particular time so we want to go to that particular time when they're saying no this is when they noticed the challenge so i'm just going to scroll down I'm trying to locate the particular time the admin taught us. Okay. So 
also here. The admin told you, no, uh, I noticed I noticed after I was working on a certain quotation that I downloaded, I was working on a quotation that I downloaded, this is when this happened, and this happened uh, around 8.37 p.m. This happened on 8.37 p.m., that's when I downloaded this quotation, and uh, 8.37 p.m., 10th October, rather, sorry, 18th of October, 8.37, this is when this happened after downloading. There you go. Apologies, guys. I'm told you lost me for a second there, and I was busy talking to myself. Shame. Mm, so I'm going to reshare my screen. Okay. Uh, please, can somebody confirm they can hear me? Sambu, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you, Emma. Man. Okay, great, 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 great. So I'm told I stopped at the, I stopped at the timestamps. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so the, the, the system admin in this case mentions to you that I, I downloaded the quotation. I was working on the quotation overnight. Uh, I received the quotation, so now I had to work on this quotation overnight and that's the next thing just after downloading the quotation and everything else went berserk so now they tell you the time they downloaded the quotation is uh, they downloaded the, this quotation uh, at exactly they tell you know i downloaded the quotation at 8 37 pm okay and using that particular timestamp, you go on to your os forensics and see what they were doing at 8 8 37 pm and you see for real that okay there's this quotation that's, that's located in a bank of people downloads and it's titled request for quotation. So, okay, 
uh, there's this RF queue. With your knowledge of Windows, I mentioned, I stressed how important understanding these particular operating systems, the language of operating systems, the Linux operating system, the Windows operating system, the Macintosh operating system, understanding how they operate and all the languages. I stress the importance of that as a forensic investigator. So you have your columns for timestamps and the activity. So here on the activity, you see it says jump list. So with your knowledge of the Windows operating system, you see when, when it says jump list, meaning that the user instructed the computer system to open that particular application, it, the jump list means instructing the computer system to execute the exe so or open the folder so then you see okay they actually did run this request for quotation but then they're saying that no i just downloaded the quotation and everything else went bizarre so after that you now see your windows defender running then after that you see prefetch activities all these start running so now you now see another jump list activity on request for quotation taking note of this particular timestamps so you know you know see this is downloaded it's it's down it's in the downloads you now see it's in the downloads you see it in pretty much every folder that's on the computer system this readme.txt so now with that established you you not to say okay this is a problem with a particular quotation that they downloaded even though they're claiming that they didn't click on the quotation so we've borrowed from this aspect of computer forensics of you analyzing the disk analyzing the logs these are logs analyzing the logs and from you analyzing the logs you've established where the cancer is where the problem began when they downloaded this quotation and did a jump list of the quotation they opened the quotation and everything else went bizarre your windows defender starts running uh prefetch activities start running bam and dam activities start running which is rather unusual so then after that you you have you have a sample of the image you have a sample of of the particular quotation you have a, you have a sample of the quotation that's the cancer in this case then you you get another element of analysis which is malware analysis so with that element of malware Come analysis on. you now then in turn go on to a tool i did mention certain cyber security tools that you can use for malware analysis for this particular demo i'll be using what is known as well, intesa so you get that sample of the cancer that you're suspecting to be the problem because everything else was fine until they did a jump list on that quotation so now you get the you get that particular request for quotation and try running it in your malware analysis tools yeah so so this particular this particular tool adds you to analyze a, mal a malicious file um in a dynamic way as well as a static way so it's it's really it's really a good tool yeah in that it's going to run the malicious file so that you can understand what the malicious file is trying to do it's also going to decompile the malicious file it's going to reverse engineer the malicious file so this is the request quotation file that you've uploaded onto this particular malware analysis tool so it's request for quotation that's what it's written but then my inters are right away after uploading it flags and says this 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 particular file is malicious highly malicious and its main family is wanna cry okay wanna cry you go on to understand now okay what are its ttpcs ttps's then you would go on according to the mitre attack you want, you want to understand its tactics and its techniques what it can do how it has been mapped according to mitre you see here it says it writes a potential ransom message to the disk this is what it does remember we talked about types of malware analysis dynamic and static analysis so now we're now running this malware in a controlled environment and trying to find out after running it how it acts in a computer environment so here we see that this thing actually 
um, it writes a potential ransom message on a disk, and this is quite severe, and it attempts to modify the desktop wallpaper. As you saw previously, that the desktop wallpaper was just black, and it attempts to delete and modify volume shadow copies. It deletes its tracks, and it modifies boot up configuration settings. It creates a set of registry keys to log on series of bytes. So you now understand, according to the MITRE attack, its techniques, what it's able to do. Then, still according to the MITRE attack, you see that, okay, no, um, it's, it's persistent. It, upon booting up and upon booting up or logging onto the computer system, it executes registry keys. Its invasions, its defensive invasions is that it modifies registry keys. So by modifying registry keys, you won't be able to know where it came from because it has modified the registry. You won't be able to know what it's trying to do. It's trying to delete and cover its tracks. Then credential access, uh, it steals web session cookie and secured credential credentials in the files. Then the discovery, you also see that uh, the process, it's process discovery, software discovery, everything else it runs mapped onto a MITRE attack. So uh, after this lecture, you might you might want to research what is the MITRE attack, uh, and just particular, in particular, because this is a whole big subject. But I'll stick to malware analysis for now. So yeah, then the impact you see the impact at the end here. If you're able to see its impact, what is the impact? The impact is that uh, data is encrypted. That's the greatest impact. And you did see there that, yes, the data was encrypted. Then you go on to see its IOCs. So it's, um, what are its IOCs? This particular, this particular system, what are its IOCs? So its IOCs is that you have these particular IP addresses. You can copy these IP addresses and later on analyze them. So you're able to see, okay, this request for quotation, it's communicating to these particular IPs. When you get these IPs and run them on your virus total, what are you able to find? Where are these IPs originating from? What country are they coming from? What computer systems is it communicating with? This is now when you understand its network operations. Then you can go on to understand its behavior. So this is how it behaves. Before you run it, the computer system is like this. After you run it, modifies the wallpaper and everything else. It then adds a decryption message. Then it then starts to slow down program and asks you to restart programs. Then it brings up a timer. So this is how it acts. So now this is its process tree. This is the malware now. It has been decompiled. Its code has been decompiled and you can see everything, what's embedded in the malware, the payload, the payloads that are now in the malware, the ports and the IP addresses. We did speak into the IP addresses. It's activities on the registry. You can see all that. The files that it deletes on the computer systems. So you can see all that. And now all this marriage together, this now becomes, uh, this now becomes what you put in your forensic report so you can go on now and detect on onto the detect and hunt column you see the ip addresses it's marrying to the source network activity and you can see where it was seen in you can also see that okay this is relating to the razaras group so now you can go on and research about the razaras group and if you had to present this in courts of law, you can now know and nail it down on the perpetrator. Okay, you have your perpetrator here. So after analyzing this, this pretty much gives you all the forensic evidence that you need to put in the report. This done in a very sound manner following the chain of custody now becomes your forensic case that you build. So after analyzing the malware and after analyzing the logs, the operations on the disk and what it was doing, this now gives you your evidence. And from it, you now do your forensic report in a forensic 
accepted manner and present in the courts of law. So now this this brings us to the end of today's class. But before we go, just in case we have a few people that are excited to see how WannaCry actually runs. So quickly, this should just take about a minute. Quickly, this should take about a minute. I'm going to go ahead and I have this environment that we see, that, 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 that we can see here. And this was this is the infected environment. This environment was infected. And let's go on to a clean environment that isn't infected and we try to run it in real time, see what the system admin was actually saying. Hope the virtual machine doesn't perform. Technology has got bad manners of failing you. No, it's not failing us. Great. So uh, I'd like to believe this is a very clean environment. It's uninfected. Bank of the people. System admin logs in. The working late hours as the incident stated. So they put in their credentials. They log on. Just let it just load. They log on. They have um, they have all this. They've got their Zoom here. Uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, Mike Nandu, uh, Mike Nandu, everything, everything. All these files are opening. Cross check right up. Everything is opening just fine. Everything is opening just fine. I am going to show you client information. Yeah. So everything, all the, all the files are opening just fine. Top five, top universities all that so think of this as client data think of this as credit card information think of this as people that are supposed to pay back loans that are stored on this critical server people that have finished paying back loans people that have savings account so think of this information as that this is a critical server of a bank information in your downloads information in your pictures information on your desktop all this information is opening just fine so you now go to your download and find the system admin. We are the system admin in this case. They download this quotation. They're working overnight. They find they download the quotation. Okay, a client requesting for a quotation. I've downloaded it. Uh, let me just do this so that uh, this can be very quick. Uh, uh, I was just about to run it on my network. <laughs> I was just about to run into my network. Uh, yeah, a boot mission. So, uh, yeah, this is an actual ransomware. I was going to be damned right now. Seriously damned. Let me just do this. Yeah. I didn't switch off the, ne the network adapter for this particular virtual machine. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> oh my god um, again guys uh, you remember uh, uh, uh. i said in our last lesson use a vm yeah so exactly what i meant but make sure you disconnect from the network oh my goodness <laughs> but to be safe you just don't play with malware yeah just don't just play don't. with malware to be safe yeah i was just about to run it on our network would have been dead meat. Okay. Okay, I think we've disabled the adapter. Let's just double check. Now I'm even hallucinating. Okay, it's disabled. Fine. Some who you've seen, it's disabled. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Here we go. Let it run again. This time it won't be on the network. I'll just be observing Darkness and CrowdStrike while you're doing this. <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> In any case, to be safe. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have network connectivity. This virtual machine is no longer connected to my network. Then we can now run on. I'll run somewhere. Run, I'll run somewhere. 
this is the system admin we've downloaded this I put a password so that I can think for the second time before I put in the password to the to the malware so it just helps me as I put the password to think of my end of the network and myself is it safe to run it yeah because this is very malicious software it does mad things and put the password twice just in case you never know there we go so they download and they open it in this case just give me a second i want to just do this so that this doesn't take forever um otherwise it's it's gonna go through with Windows Defender turned on, it's gonna do its, it's gonna do its thing. It's going to encrypt everything, but it's just going to take a bit longer. And time is not our best ally. I just want to show you guys this. So, doesn't matter. Windows Defender on or off, it's definitely going to encrypt your files and everything. So, um, they download this. This is the request for quotation folder. They open the folder and they want to see the performer invoice from bank from the bank then this guy runs it and it opens this for him he doesn't understand he's opening a quotation why is all this opening read me what's all this no i think i opened the wrong file let me close all this they tried to close all that the screen has changed just like that and now there's cmd popping up no i don't want this and what's happening try to refresh no i had let me try to run the awareness program then this pops up now oops your files have been encrypted what's happened to your computer yeah these guys are quite kind they'll explain to you what's happening and how you need to get back your data how much you need to pay and everything else so this opens now no i'm not interested in this we try to open another file the cv remember our cv was opening remember everything else was opening so it's encrypting right now try to run zoom so top universities remember we opened top universities it's no longer opening so think of this as client data that has been lost Think of this as credit card information, loan repayment, everything that has been lost. And it's all encrypted. You can't do anything about it. So this is how a ransomware attack happens in real time. This is, I have dealt with similar incidents. Uh, I can't mention names, but a number of banks where I have walked in and done digital forensics and I find the environment is just like this. This is it. And I have to pick it up and start and do my forensic analysis and find out what went wrong what group this particular ransomware belongs to how do we recover from this can we recover our data can we recover our data uh, do a forensic report analyze and understand how much data has been lost and so this is how a ransomware attack happens in real time so in the interest of time i'm gonna end our presentation for today here this is how we end our lecture for today i'm done i'm done and emma are you still on the call no emma has given right to me i'll i'll, I'll end the, i'll end the class to you <laughs> okay yeah so you can i don't know do you give them time to ask questions no i'm no, guessing no. They, they can ask questions in the classroom okay fine so this is how our lecture for today ends so that is what digital forensics and cyber investigation is all about and this is how you perform actual digital forensics as well as forensic investigations so that's pretty much everything thank you very much mr mike everyone i i know you all enjoyed that uh it's not uh 
every day we get to it and say around somewhere. But unfortunately, as professionals, we do all the time. But yeah, so um, the slides will be shared on the portal. So um, everyone, with anyone on the portal will see it in due time. And uh, just know that uh, there, there will be a quiz for this opening tonight, uh, opening tomorrow morning, uh, opening tomorrow morning on forensics. Make sure you do that. And the previous quiz will close today on network security that I did um, last week. Yeah. Okay. So, Mike, thank you very much, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope we're all aware that we should not download just anything from anywhere there's a risk potentially everyone internet okay do not practice on your host machine use a virtual environment thank you all and see you for the next one next week yeah so plus b has never had quizzes or notes shared uh let me get to emma and get that p3 Is this mostly class B? Because I'm only signed to class A. Let me get to Emma about that one. Because I've only been assigned to class A. But I assure you, let us uh, get back to you on that one. And then we'll actually give you guys more time to do quizzes and go through the material. Okay. All right, thank you everyone, and get back to you on your queries, and yeah. All right, good day. Your, your material is under the class materials, it's there. Others have access to it, so you should have access to it as well. Just check properly. All right. Take care.